Wartime austerity measures meant there was little new in the way of mainline motive power at the time of nationalisation. Among the notable exceptions were Bullitt's two types of Pacific passenger locomotive. This is the rebuilt West Country version, minus its spam can casing and controversial chain-driven valve gear and enclosed oil bath. What it did have was a brilliant boiler and a firebox fabricated in steel. The seam, like, like anything with a boiler, is a superb boiler. That's one of the pluses of a locomotive, it's a it's a modern design of boiler if you can have a modern steam engine and it's got a steel firebox which is steel is obviously weldable copper is much more difficult to to do uh, just a, a great design of boiler the nationalized railways were planning to standardize locomotive design under riddles who'd been sanya's right hand man on the lms there was a lot they could learn from engines like tall valley but lesson number one was not to get involved in too many design experiments which had plagued these otherwise excellent southern engines. The West Country's footplate, complete with electric lighting and comfy seats, was a thoroughly modern layout, and Riddles would have been impressed by its steam raising capacity. But his job was not an easy one. He came in as nationalisation started, didn't he, 1947-48, um, and was charged with making a standard class of locomotives which would suit each region. And from that point of view, I think he's been very successful, but it must have been a little bit of a poison chalice because Everybody wanted to go in their direction at that time, um, and he had to pull the whole lot together and make very viable and uh, less labour-intensive locomotives, which would run the railway, as it turns out, into the mid-60s. One way of making a locomotive less labour-intensive is to limit it to two outside cylinders so that the motion is accessible. And why not make sure someone else has already designed out the bugs? Riddles needed to look no further than the best of Midland locomotive design, like this tank engine. Ivert's Class II locomotive was to become one of the blueprints of standard design. The roomy cab was typical of a practical design which had already been tested on regions other than the Midland. Southern railwaymen still remember them fondly. When they came out, they replaced, because if Bricklayer's Arms used to have a lot of carriage sidings all over the place, um, um, Blackheath, Maysdale, Grove Park, they were where they kept empty coaching stock. And some of the jobs we had at Bricklayer's Arms was to get hold of one of these C-class, H-star stamp, get hold of these coach, and you'd run around all day with this coaching in the different places while it was cleaned and washed, pick it up in the city in the morning and take it back in the evening. All day he was on these trains and these little late class tanks. Along come the eye of it tank, and they made job, the job a lot easier, because there was plenty of room, nice room we can. The only thing was that we found that if you drop back to 160 pounds of steam, the brakes started going on. It was something we, had, we learned the hard way. You know, we was going up over the arches into London, and we were coming to a stand with a vacuum brake going on. There was a reason for it, but we found out what it was after a while. As well as the 262 layout, Riddles and his designers adopted the LMS 264 layout for the Class 4 tack that was to become one of the most successful of all the standard designs. And they hadn't forgotten the Black 5 either. A higher running plate, bigger driving wheels and slightly more power were included in the standard Class 5 machine that was eventually to find its way onto some of the heaviest trains rostered alongside much bigger engines. Some of these much-admired middleweights were even given names. This one is Camelot. This is the Class 4 tender engine introduced in 1951. By now, the engineers had done nearly all they could. They played about with double chimneys, exotic valve gear and boilers even mechanical stokers, 
and built a single three-cylinder engine, the Duke of Gloucester. But what they couldn't do was attract young lads to a career on the railways in a world where labour was scarce and where there were easier ways to earn a living, especially in the depths of winter. The bottom line is that the steam engine will always need a two-man crew. It has built-in labour costs that can't be reduced. The cost of things changes. Um, this Bluebell Railway couldn't survive without voluntary effort because that degree of manpower would, it's not, it's not viable to, to, to purchase that. Um, in engineering terms and railway terms, things changed, things became easier to operate, less manpower was needed to look after an engine. Things like um, the grates were rocking so that you didn't have to shovel it all out at the end of the day, you could just drop it through into the ash pan. You pull a lever and all the ash would just drop out the bottom of that. Um, no end of things. Lubrication was made easier, purely to not have so many ground men on the ground. Um, the cost of materials went down, the cost of labour went up. were the most fascinating time, I think, in our railway heritage, because that's when the standard locos were designed and came in, in a last dying gasp, I suppose, to try and make steam engines viable commercially. And Black Prince, of course, my engine, was only eight years old when I bought her, and the 17th last locomotive to be built, and would have been scrapped years before our time. The job of fireman was one of the least understood and most responsible on the railways. Towards the end of steam, lads of 16 or 17 were thrown into a man-sized roll, and not all of them stayed the course. The engine driver was unlikely to leave the job, but the turnover in firemen was colossal. A lot of documentaries always written or filmed about the driving side of the steam locomotive. It's the thing that people see the most, with the questions we're always after, you the driver. But some people want to know about the firing side, and for my mind, the fireman's job is actually the more difficult. He's got a very difficult balancing act to perform. He needs to keep sufficient boiler pressure for the locomotive to work. He needs to keep sufficient water in the boiler to stop it from exploding. He needs to keep a good, decent, efficient fire that will keep the water temperature hot and therefore provide the steam. He's got to provide the steam to the driver's requirements. If the driver starts using a lot of steam, he'll use a lot more water. And the more water that's being used means more coal has to be put on. And on top of that, if that's not enough, he's got to sweep the floor and keep a good lookout and observe and obey and relay all instructions to the driver. Ads who joined the railways towards the end of steam can still remember the horror of their first encounter with a dying industry. Well, I started as a cleaner in, in 1962, uh, 15 years old, filthy, stinking engine shed. Uh, the only modern thing in there were the electric lights in the roof. Everything else was from the last century, really. Uh, I've never seen anything like it in my life, but uh, I stuck with it. Uh, and you start off as an engine cleaner, and that's cleaning the outsides of them, not the insides, as some people thought. So uh, you just basically clean steam engines until you were 16, and which time you started your firing training. When Malcolm Hall joined the railways in 1962, a lot of the shunting work was already being done by diesel. This humble box on wheels had been around since the mid-50s, and it'll still be with us well into the 21st century, arguably one of the greatest locomotive designs of all time. But it did steam no favours. This was the scene at Barry Island in South Wales, the date is 1967, and Dye Woodham's yard is overflowing. 
British Railways were rushing to get rid of steam, even though some of the engines were almost brand new. However, give them a few months in the sea air and they'd all look ready for the cutter's torch. And a whole generation of railwaymen were thrown on the scrap heap too. They, they shared with me my love of steam. They loved steam. They weren't just workers in a factory. They, it, was a, it was a life to them, like coal miners. You know, they, they, and they were heartbroken when steam finished and they were all thrown on the scrap heap with the engines. Because you know, I knew them from Guildford Shed just down the road from where I lived. Got to know all the lads. And there were tears you know, when steam finished, they closed the shed because they were chucked away as well. David Shepherd was determined to save one of the mighty 9Fs. The 9Fs were the ultimate in steam locomotive design and thrown away years before their time. It was a monstrous waste of money. We were chucking them away when they were built. We were actually throwing away 9Fs. I think we got 251 of the 9Fs. And some were being thrown away for razor blades while we were still building new ones. Should Riddles's masterpiece have been discarded so quickly? I think if you look at the last design, the 9F heavy freight locomotive, um, it was so versatile, an extremely powerful locomotive. It could pull passenger trains. They were not maintenance free, but easy to maintain, relatively speaking. And I think you've got to judge the man on that. That's the way they were going. But he never really finished his job, did he? Because change of emphasis, you know, over to dieselisation and electrification, he never really finished what he was doing. But yeah, I think he was successful. To understand why these engines were mourned, all you have to do is ask a railwayman. Well, it's a, it's a lot more comfortable because you've got a nice seat <laughs> and you've got this at the back of you and you've got a tender that is more or less covers the whole thing in. So they were more creature comforts, as they say, on the standard engines than a lot of the other engines, even LMER engines, where there was low tenders. The opinion of the engine driver counted for very little in a world of change, and soon whole classes of engine were mirages in the memory. The Kings had gone as early as 1962. The Bullids would escape the executioner for up to five years longer. The frenetic dying days of steam in 1967 in the south of England, where I live. I took three weeks off. Um, I could barely afford it because I was frantic doing elephant pictures, you know, to pay the bills for all this. Commissions of elephants and wildlife, which I was doing by now. But I, I thought I've got to record something on the canvas, so I took three weeks. Either Nine Elms Shed at Waterloo or Guildford Shed. In fact, I'd be painting a picture of elephants all day for somebody, and I'd bung my easel and paints into the Land Rover and charge off to Guildford Shed. And just no, no legality about it. The Shed must say, oh, I don't care what you do, mate. It's all falling apart anyway. You know, I don't bother with a footplate pass or anything. I spent half the time riding on illegal footplate passes, doing ballast trains around Aldershot. All illegal. <laughs> That's another story. But um, I had to record something, if just colour sketches, you know, quick notes, because, OK, a colour camera can record, to some degree, authentic colour, but it cannot, I don't, I'm sounding pompous now, but I don't think it can compete with the brain and the eyes of an artist. One by one, the rusty relics were recovered from Barry Island. Without Guy Woodham, there would be no steam sanctuaries like this, places that were built just like Noah's Ark to save the various species of steam, although sadly not all of them survive. Often, it was schoolboys who showed the way, using pocket money and the optimism of youth to buy the first engines for preservation. This was the day that 1466 came back to life. The boys had to run for a box of matches so they could light the fire. Mr Woodham agreed to delay cutting up the last of the engines so that enthusiasts had as much leeway as possible for fundraising. Youngsters would tour the scrapyard looking for bits and pieces which could be salvaged. The cost of remanufacturing lost components was to prove astronomical in later years. But a few engines never went to the scrapyard at all. The Merchant Navy locomotive clan line was earmarked for preservation years in advance. These engines ceased to run in 1967. For the last three or four years of their service life, uh, a whole group of us used to go around on the southern region recording them, photographing them, travelling behind them. And uh, it was fortunate that it was announced about two years before they actually stopped running that they were going to come to the end of their lives. And we simply decided that we didn't want to do without them. So we, we clubbed together and put adverts in the enthusiast press asking for donations to see if we could get enough money actually to preserve one. 
Um, it was all done with the giddy innocence of use. We had no idea what we were taking on. We had no idea what we were going to do with it if we did manage to buy it. But we persevered and uh, we eventually managed to raise £2,200, which was the scrap value of the locomotive in those days, and bought it. To buy clan line, I was involved with clan line, which is now on the main line, bless her. Uh, and, and we were selling borrow pens and calendars for two shillings each in Old English money to raise the money. Clan line cost, I think, 1,200 quid. That was the scrap value. And we bought her, and now she's run like that princess. So I think we did achieve a lot, we really did. Amazing. Today, Clam 9 pops up all over southern England. Here she crosses the River Ada at Shoreham after delivering people for a Glen Miller evening at the local airport. It's a curious twist of fate that steam survived longer than British Railways, whose propaganda films from the 70s included the astonishing claim that motorways were losing out. In the 1960s and on into the 70s, trains were winning passengers back from the internal airlines and from the motorways. They did it by improving the ride, by increasing comfort, by running, as they always have, city centre to city centre, and above all, by shortening journey times for intercity travellers. There were big achievements like the electrification of the West Coast Main Line. But this odd-looking diesel is living evidence that not all was well with our nationalised railway system. There's nothing wrong with a design philosophy that tries to give the driver a grandstand view of what's going on around him. The trouble was, BR was commissioning all sorts of non-standard designs and later throwing them away because they weren't standard. This class started appearing in 1964. Some of them lasted just two years. It was an appalling waste of national resources. This much-loved class, on the other hand, is still going strong after 40 years, even if it does look like one of Doctor Who's Daleks when first viewed head-on. It had one huge built-in design fault. The drivers were complaining they couldn't see past that great long nose when running in the forward direction. So these engines spent most of their lives coupled in pairs, with a cab at each end and this particular individual removed spoil from the Channel Tunnel before retiring to the Bodmin and Wenford Railway. Meanwhile, back in the 70s, Lord Haw Haw appeared to be alive and well and working for BR. The Romance of Steam. Yes, for some romance, for others, muck everywhere. In your eyes, your ears, in your hair. Now, between London, Southampton and Bournemouth, electricity sweeps all that away. Commuting to London from what used to be far away places is now so easy. The message seemed to be that third rail was a new invention, and that Austin 1100 owners from Bournemouth couldn't wait to get crushed in a crowd in London every day. David Shepherd remembers it well. You know, I mean, I have to accept, look, let's face it, in spite of all my nostalgia and my love of the past, we have to accept that steam had to go in the end. Um, for one simple reason, you would not get a young guy now to do what those young farmen had to do. You know, just imagine leaving, leaving Euston to go to Crewe on a Dutch Pacific, how many tons of coal you'd have to shift. You sweated your gut out to do that job. And a diesel is much cleaner, it's much more, I nearly said efficient. Well, it probably is more efficient, I don't know, electric. Um, so that's one reason why steam died, it was dirty. I bemoaned the passing because I mean Liverpool Street, we used to live in Essex eventually and we used to come into London, into Liverpool Street to go to the theatre with Daddy and Mummy and I'd have my suit on and by the time I'd left Liverpool Street I was like a farmer myself. I mean everything in Liverpool Street was covered in three inches of soot and filth. Lovely, wonderful, but the modern age wouldn't accept that. It's all clean now, it's like a greenhouse. No, the modern age we live in um, and it has to come. The clean and green modern age has not only come, for many diesel locomotives, the modern age has come and gone. Nowadays, the traction that displays steam is often a museum piece itself, like this Class 25 engine working an enthusiast special on the West Somerset Railway. Half the population of Britain can't even remember steam, and to them, classic traction is a diesel engine. This fabulous Western class engine was, by 1961, the third generation of mainline diesel to run on Brunel's hallowed railway, but hydraulic traction was deemed non-standard by the organisation that had built it. 
And so this was generation number four, the Plumas 50. They weren't built for the southwest of England at all, but for the northwest. When that plan changed, the R drafted them onto the Paddington services, confident that they'd stay there well into the next century. Of course, they didn't. Another fine engine which many enthusiasts believe was chucked away long before its time, and now, like Deltic, is to be seen creeping back onto mainline duty. Since privatisation, these classic diesels have been recognised as still very usable for frontline service. Others, like the 33s, disappeared gradually and had almost gone by the time their absence was really noticed. various classes of diesel came and went, one in particular appeared to be timeless. The 47, diesel's equivalent of the Black Five, seen here scurrying away from Eastleigh like a bat out of hell as it goes in search of its train. one that may last even longer, the 37. The leading engine will end up at the National Railway Museum. All of these engines are being chased away by the North American Brigade whose invasion bridgehead was the mighty Class 59 that so revolutionised traction in this country when it started removing the Mendips in rather large chunks. The plan is for the new 66s to sweep away most of the 60s stuff. These are literally just off the boat at Newport. But it's interesting to note that even they are being pushed around by one of those old diesel shunters that have found their way into every corner of the railway network. The one doing the pushing and shoving at Newport is of a batch built way back in 1961. But the future of these diesel shunters seems assured by their new American owner, who's announced that he too is reluctant to let them go. We've got about two or three hundred left within EWS, um, and they're used mainly for shunting in yards and sidings where, you know, to waste a bigger locomotive is not good use of resources. They've been tremendous stalwarts of our railway network for many, many years, and I think we're going to see them for many, many years to come. But what about the 47, like this one, at the head of a travelling post office train sweeping through Newport on the day yet another batch of 66s arrive? Can EWS guarantee that the 47s will still be around in a few years' time? I mean, they're still a very popular machine with the drivers and also with the, with the general enthusiasts. Um, there'll be a few around in, in, uh, for about another two or three years, but then I think most of them will probably have gone. Um, they've done tremendous work you know, up and down the country for many years, and uh, it'd be sad to see them go. If I had the money and I wanted to buy diesel, I'd buy a 47. Yeah, I think they're fine engines. That's nice. I've got to be fair to the diesel fanatics on that. <laughs> The growl of the 37 will be with us for longer, at least the more heavyweight members of the class will, having proved their reliability over many years. Oh, uh, fantastic. I mean, certainly there's going to be one or two, I think, one at the National Rail Museum, which um, you know, will be d donated to them when it's finished its life of an EWS. Um, clearly, they've still got a future with us, as some of the heavyweight ones, the 37.7s and 37.5s, will be used for many years to come, but the rest, I'm afraid, sadly, will be going. There's been another real winner among the diesels. By the early 1970s, a train that could reach 125 miles per hour on the straight was running experimentally. It was called HST, a high-speed train, and it was diesel hauled. 
Where would we be without the HST? It's a rainy day in Devon, but the train makes light work of the dreaded Dainton Bank. rain or shine, the hundred or so train sets are to be found tirelessly pounding up and down the network at three-figure speeds where the track permits, the flexible friend of the travelling public for so many years. This one is running along the seawall at Dawlish. But was the diesel era one great big mistake? I mean, I've heard people say that we should never have gone into diesel at all. We should have jumped straight from, street, from steam into electric traction uh, because it's probably cleaner and more efficient. I, I don't know. Again, I'm on slightly dangerous ground because I'm not very knowledgeable enough. Some of the finest diesels, like the Peaks, only survive at all today because of the efforts of preservationists who've had to put a brave face on things in recent years. Nowadays, the customers are children, and a mighty warrior that once wandered the Midland, Western, and Eastern main lines finds itself tootling up and down the mid hands, doubling as devious diesel, the two faced engine. It's better than extinction. What really rescued the preservation movement, whether the purists like it or not, was Thomas the Tank Engine the Reverend Audrey's famous character as resurrected by Britt Allcroft. Its phenomenal popularity with children who'd never seen a steam engine was the wonder of the 1980s. They still queue up to meet James or to see Douglas the Black Engine make a quick getaway with an Easter special to Alton. This may look like a U-class engine to you and me. In fact, it may look specifically like engine number 31625, late of Guildford Shed. But to the paying customers, this is Douglas, and the customer is always right. Because it's the customer's pocket money that will pay to put this S15 together again. to 45% of the mid Hans's entire annual revenue comes from two Thomas events. Children started the preservation movement, children keep it going. Among the more astonishing achievements in the heritage era is the saving of a chunk of Great Central Railway in the East Midlands, a main line railway being returned to twin track running.
or there's that beautiful recreation of the Isle of Wight's Victorian trains by a relatively small band of dedicated railway people. David Shepherd is proud to be the railway's president. I paid or helped to pay for Calvon, which is now on the Isle of Wight. That lovely little Victorian steam railway. The whole thing is Victorian. That's one of the craziest, stupidest things we ever did, getting rid of steam like we did in this rush to dieselize in the 60s, because if they'd saved all the railway on the Isle or most of it, saved all Calborn sisters, they cut them all up except Calborn and I think one other, they cut them all up for railway, threw away all these lovely Victorian coaches, if they'd left the whole lot, my God, that could be one of the biggest tourist attractions in this country now. The rest of the railway system on the Isle was turned into a modern railway, in inverted commas, by using 1930 underground stock from the Northern Line running to Barnet, you know, and then when they took that onto the Isle they found the platforms were all the wrong height, so they had to lower the platform, raise it. Oh, God, it's crazy. Sorry, I mean, I'm so wound up about the stupid things we did in the 60s. <laughs> People with long memories in the preservation movement can still remember the rather patronising way they were treated by BR, but take pride in the fact that time has proved them well able to run railways. The Bluebell is a highly successful multi-million pound operation nowadays. Well, I'm sure that uh, the big boys would have looked over their shoulder and, and smiled and, and, and certainly raised their eyebrows and said, yes, that'll be a five-minute wonder and they'll move on to something else next when they realise exactly what's involved. And I think that's where, um, certainly as, as far as Bluebell was concerned, it, it has always set itself out to prove its critics wrong and that it wants to show um, what can be done. The aim now, and it's our, our main focus, is, is to reach East Grinstead, another further two miles up the line. Enthusiast specials from up north could uh, come down to here and we're already thinking that in fact Kingscote will be the place where we'll change locomotives and a steam locomotive will, will take the, the visiting train on. As the 1990s came to a close, steam was re-establishing a role for itself all over the country. On a cold winter's morning, another dedicated team prepares to make railway history. The recently rediscovered Rood Ashton Hall is about to leave Tisley, turning the famous Birmingham engine shed, now a museum, back into an operational base. Tisley has long wanted to run steam shuttles to Stratford, giving the people of Birmingham a different option for a day out. On this historic Sunday, Bob Meanley and his men will get their chance. Today is probably the culmination of a very long-held dream at Tisley, as long as Tisley has been there. It's wanted to operate Stratford trains on a regular basis. We've done it as special trains in the days when they are uh, permitted occasional trains at bank holidays once every year or whatever. Um, but we've had a tremendous amount of support from rail track, from central trains, from EWS railway, from the city of Birmingham, from Stratford District Council, who all want to see these tourist trains succeed. And I think it's one of the marvellous things of privatisation that you're able to actually think about this and talk about it seriously and commercially. The engine is now in superb condition after more than 30 years sitting around the yard in pieces. It lay around at Tisley for an awful long time. We've used it as a barometer really. When Tisley's been doing well, we've sort of taken the haul out and dusted it off and probably taken a few more bits off it. And when times have got hard, it's gone back into the siding, uh, minus a few more bits. And uh, we made a determined effort uh, about three years ago to pick it up uh, with this job in mind because it's an ideal engine. Really, to use a castle on a job like this is a bit of overkill with those four cylinders whizzing up and down inside the, the, the frames of the engine. Right away. The hall's condition is a tribute to the skills of Tysley's full-time staff, but also to a group of teenagers who've laboured long and hard towards this moment. There's a tremendous amount of effort being put into this engine by a group of volunteers who are all under the age of 20. Uh, six individuals in particular, uh, led really, I suppose, by my son Alistair, um, the most wonderful band of young people you could ever wish to meet and uh, you know the quality of things like the boiler casing and a lot of the boiler work uh, has, has all been done by then. It's a terribly important day for the Birmingham team. If Rude Ashton Hall performs as they expect and if the people of the Midlands will support them, the region could have a new tourist attraction that is both a slice of living heritage and a way of easing road congestion. had to rebuild its rail links into Snow Hill Station. But this one link is special. Steam is back.
It's a spectacular achievement against the odds by people of courage. In talking about steam railways particularly, an enormous amount has been achieved by the steam railway fraternity. I mean, I'm told there are about two million railway enthusiasts in this country. Not all of them have done perhaps as much as they could, but we have achieved a colossal amount. A few minutes later, the engine reappears from the other end of the tunnel, running tender first with express headboard carried jauntily, and the city is bathed in sunlight as if to celebrate a sparkling moment in transport history. Rude Ashton Hall grumbled a bit during the climb back to Birmingham first time round, but it was only like watching someone waking up from a long sleep, and by the end of the day she'd be making light work of the trailing load of nine. It's been a long time since Tysley operated as an entity on the main line and um, you know we've taken a lot of our staff um, and, and they've performed in my opinion faultlessly, professionally um, and I'm just proud to tell of them. The exercise was a great success but there was more to it than that. It was something about the sky. Britain's last engine was called Evening Star and that night at Stratford there was just one prominent star which twinkled above the steam and became lost in a shower of sparks as Rude Ashton Hall prepared to go home. David Shepherd believes you have to be mad to restore these steam engines and says, thank God we are. I wouldn't live in any other country. This is the finest nation in the world. And one of the things that makes the British so terrific is that we're full of eccentrics. This country is eccentric, full of mad people who think, my God, bugger bureaucracy, damn the money, we're going to do it. A few months later, a forlorn trio of diesels were standing dead beside the turntable at another former Great Western shed, witnessing another miracle. Note the shed plate, 81A. King Edward I was kicked out of this very shed nearly 40 years ago. The king was dead. Long live the king. But what about tomorrow's engines? Old Oak Common is a shadow of its former self. Will the new generation of locomotives mean a change of fortune for our railways? Surprisingly, perhaps, the answer is almost certainly yes. Freight traffic on the railways is projected to triple in the next 10 years. And that's why new engines are arriving in Britain. Well, basically, we've got uh, 250 new locomotives coming across from Canada. Um, and what you see here are about another 10 of those who have come across the several thousand miles from the Canada and US side to be over here. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic operation when you consider they're built you know, several thousand miles away, brought over here, and within 36 hours of arriving in this country, there's straight traffic working on trains. They're the state-of-the-art new technology that we've got here. Um, and what they will do is they will enable us to buy more modern and uh, environmentally friendly equipment, which will replace some of the outdated locomotives we've had for many years. So this is the shape of things to come. But it's a shape the steam enthusiasts are not particularly interested in. At least one steam loco was hauling 2,000 tonnes years ago, and that was Black Prince. First train she hauled, loose coupled, up the hill, slightly up the hill, with, from a dead stop, worth 1,600 tonnes, on her own. She did that as though she was not knowing she had anything behind her. Then they put it up to 2,000, and then the last run was 2,364 tonnes. She did it on her own, and that, that uh, said something to the diesel phonetics. However, there is one thing the new engines can do which we should all be pleased about. They can take heavy traffic off the roads. And locomotive number 66064 is about to prove it in style. Her driver is the popular Eastleigh steam expert, John Smith. Everything that I do on this locomotive today will be recorded in here. And we call it, its name is Qtron. It's an onboard computer and it'll, it'll actually put a print out um, if my inspector wants to see how I've been behaving for the day, he can tell me what he's going to do and he can come along and he can download that and he can get the whole journey. So every action I take on this locomotive 
putting the windscreen wipers on, operating the sands, sounding the horn, the brakes, what power levels, settings I've got is all on here. And this is your power handle. And it's got eight settings on here, well nine if you can include idle. So it goes from nine, we're not in full view, we've got the brakes on, so right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can hear the engine revving up, it's, it's actually putting power on, so it comes back and we let it die back down and then we'll shut it off. The load this morning is empty fuel wagons for the refinery at Fawley, 1,600 tonnes of them. The class 37 engine on the left will follow with a second train. One man, working on his own, is about to take 160 lorry loads through the centre of Southampton in the rush hour without inconveniencing anyone on their way to work. Right on going through. That's probably the Ripple Lane going up, going up to Dagenham in East London. <coughs> this is a view you get with through Southampton Tunnel now, going under the city. Um, there's all them. Commuters happily going off to work, getting soaking wet, walking across the top. So this is Southampton Central Station as we're coming out through the road of it. There's Toys R Us on the left, that's where I try and avoid taking my grandson because he cost me a lot of money. Sixty six oh six four arrives with her immense train. The cabs are reckoned to be a bit noisy, but to the outside world these engines are incredibly quiet. The train seems to be about a quarter of a mile long. The second train arrives with the 37's characteristic growl. This is not the only old equipment around on the rail network. She's in good company. There's still plenty of the slam door stock, which commuters keep hoping is about to disappear. Another relic from the days when there was steam. Years of underinvestment and unfair play, including one government transport minister who'd been a partner in a road building firm, have left our railways in poor shape at the end of the 20th century. But David Shepherd believes we can't go on building roads. We've got to do something because with what I'm told in 20 years' time, there'll be two cars for every car there is now in this country. We're ro this country is already one massive great car parking lot, as the Americans would call it. And um, I fear, I really, I've got grandchildren. My oldest grandchild in a few years' time will be driving and she'll be sitting on that bloody M25, which was out of date before it was built. She'll be sitting in a gridlock for half her life and it's crazy. This is why I say I'm glad I'm not being born now. Many of the modern cross-country trains are simple little affairs, just coaches on rails really, two or sometimes even just one carriage. And these little trains can seem such a forlorn sight as they come to rest at the commodious platforms of a bygone age. There have of course been rail cars in the past, but these are working between major cities because demand for seats, although rising, is still very limited. Bonn is the romance and any attempt at stylish design. And it's difficult to imagine great artists trying to capture the magic of these trains on canvas. But perhaps these trains will help railway economics to make more sense. In any event, David Shepherd believes we've got to give the railways a chance, and to give privatisation a chance. Whether people can be weaned out of the motor car, 
whether the railways can price themselves back into favour and whether there should be separate ownership of the trains and the trackbed are questions that only time will decide. After a century of trains in decline, there is some good news about passenger numbers. But it's really up to the travelling public what happens next. One really sad thing that can't be denied is that the nation that invented the train is now importing not only its frontline freight engines, but also its foremost passenger express, for Eurostar is a French design. And as if to make matters worse, its prestige terminal has been built at the wrong station, for Waterloo will not be its long-term home. And somehow, even this masterpiece of technology has failed to catch the artist's eye. It's not beautiful to me, no, um, because I like to, I'd like to see... It's too smooth, it's too, it has to be, to go to that speed. It's got rid of all the sort of kitchen sink bits and pieces all over it, like a steam engine had. I mean, this is purely art, the artist in me saying this. I have no desire whatever to paint a Eurostar train, because I can't get enthusiastic about it. No, I can't. Um, I get excited about modern aeroplanes up to a point, but Concorde, I suppose, if I was asked to paint Concorde, I would do it. But I wouldn't have the same enthusiasm that I would if I was asked to paint a Lancaster, or a Hurricane, or a Spitfire. Because that was my generation, and character, character, character. I, I'm very condemning of the modern age, but I'm afraid I belong to an age long since past, and I'm very glad I was born when I was. Because I think this age is getting more and more functional, where the only thing that matters is the thing works and you throw it away and build another one. on the left, that's where I try and avoid taking my grandson because he cost me a lot of money. Sixty six oh six four arrives with her immense train. The cabs are reckoned to be a bit noisy, but to the outside world these engines are incredibly quiet. The train seems to be about a quarter of a mile long. The second train arrives with the 37's characteristic growl. They cut them all up except Carbon and I think one other. Come all up for Rainbow, threw away all these lovely Victorian coaches. If they could left the whole lot, my God, that could be one of the biggest tourist attractions in this country now. The rest of the railway system on the other way was turned into a modern railway, in inverted commas, by using 1930 underground stock from the Northern Line running to Barnet, you know, and then when they took that onto the other way, they found the platforms were all the wrong height, so they had to lower the platform and raise it. Oh, God, I'm crazy. Sorry, I mean, I'm so wound up about the stupid things we did in the 60s. <laughs> People with long memories in the preservation movement can still remember the rather patronising way they were treated by BR, but take pride in the fact that time has proved them well able to run railways. The Bluebell is a highly successful multi-million pound operation nowadays. Well, I'm sure that uh, the big boys would have looked over their shoulder and, and smiled and, and, and certainly raised their eyebrows and said, yes, that'll be a five-minute wonder and they'll move on to something else next when they realise exactly what's involved. And I think that's where, um, certainly as, as far as Bluebell was concerned, it, it has always set itself out to prove its critics wrong and that it wants to show um, what can be done. The aim now, and it's our, our main focus. One of the marvellous things of privatisation, that you're able to actually think about this and talk about it seriously and commercially. The engine is now in superb condition after more than 30 years sitting around the yard in pieces. It lay around at Tysley for an awful long time. We've used it as a barometer, really. When Tysley's been doing well, we've sort of taken the haul out and dusted it off and probably taken a few more bits off it. And when times have got hard, it's gone back into the siding, uh, minus a few more bits. And uh, we made a determined effort uh, about three years ago to pick it up uh, with this job in mind, because it's an ideal engine. Really, to use a castle on a job like this is a bit of overkill with those four cylinders whizzing up and down inside the, the, the frames of the engine. The hall's condition is a tribute to the skills of Tysley's full-time staff, 
but also to a group of teenagers who've laboured long and hard towards this moment. There's a tremendous amount of effort being put into this engine by a group of volunteers who are all under the age of 20. There's nothing wrong with a design philosophy that tries to give the driver a grandstand view of what's going on around him. The trouble was, BR was commissioning all sorts of non-standard designs and later throwing them away because they weren't standard. This class started appearing in 1964. Some of them lasted just two years. It was an appalling waste of national resources. This much-loved class, on the other hand, is still going strong after 40 years, even if it does look like one of Doctor Who's Daleks when first viewed head-on. It had one huge built-in design fault. The drivers were complaining they couldn't see past that great long nose when running in the forward direction. So these engines spent most of their lives coupled in pairs, with a cab at each end. And this particular individual removed spoil from the Channel Tunnel before retiring to the Bodmin and Wenford Railway. Meanwhile, back in the 70s, Lord Haw Haw appeared to be alive and well and working for BR. The Romance of Steam. Yes, for some romance, for others, muck everywhere. In your eyes, your ears, in your hair. Now, between London, Southampton and Bournemouth, electricity sweeps all that away. Commuting to London from what used to be far away places is now so easy. The message seemed to be that third rail was a new invention and that Austin 1100 owners from Bournemouth couldn't wait to get crushed in a crowd in London every day. David Shepherd remembers it well. You know, I mean, I have to accept, look, let's face it, in spite of all my nostalgia and my love of the past, we have to accept that steam had to go in the end. Um, for one simple reason, you would not get a young guy now to do what those young farmen had to do. You know, just imagine leaving, leaving Euston to go to Crewe on a Duchess Pacific, how many tons of coal you'd have to shift. You sweated your gut out to do that job. And a diesel is much cleaner, it's much more, I nearly said efficient. Well, it probably is more efficient, I don't know, electric. Um, so that's one reason my steam died, it was dirty. I bemoan the passing, because I mean, Liverpool Street, we used to live in Essex eventually, and we used to come into London, into Liverpool Street, to go to the theatre with Daddy and Mummy, and I'd have my suit on, and by the time I'd left Liverpool Street, I was like a farmer myself. I mean, everything in Liverpool Street was covered in three inches of soot and filth. Lovely, wonderful, but the modern age wouldn't accept that. It's all clean now, it's like a greenhouse. No, it's the modern age we live in, um, and it has to come. The clean and green modern age has not only come, for many diesel locomotives, the modern age has come and gone. Nowadays, the traction that displays steam is often a museum piece itself, like this Class 25 engine working an enthusiast special on the West Somerset Railway. Half the population of Britain can't even remember steam, and to them, classic traction is a diesel engine. This fabulous Western class engine was, by 1961, the third generation of mainline diesel to run on Brunel's hallowed railway, but hydraulic traction was deemed non-standard by the organisation that had built it. And so this was generation number four, the class 50. They weren't built for the southwest of England at all, but for the northwest. When that plan changed, BR drafted them onto the Paddington services, confident that they'd stay there well into the next century. Of course, they didn't. Another fine engine which many enthusiasts believe was chucked away long before its time, and now, like Del 51. By now, the engineers had done nearly all they could. They played about with double chimneys, exotic valve gear, boilers, even mechanical stokers, and built a single three-cylinder engine, the Duke of Gloucester. But what they couldn't do was attract young lads to a career on the railways in a world where labour was scarce and where there were easier ways to earn a living, especially in the depths of winter. The bottom line is that the steam engine will always need a two-man crew. It has built-in labour costs that can't be reduced. The cost of things changes. Um, 
this Bluebell Railway you couldn't survive without voluntary effort because that degree of manpower would it's not it's not viable to to, to purchase that um, in engineering terms and railway terms things changed things became easier to operate less manpower was needed to look after an engine things like um, the grates were rocking so that you didn't have to shovel it all out at the end of the day you could just drop it through into the ash pan you pull a lever and all the ash would just drop out the bottom of that um, no end of things lubrication was made easier purely to not have so many ground men on the ground um, the cost of materials went down the cost of labor went up The 50s were the most fascinating time, I think, in our railway heritage because that's when the standard locos were designed and came in, in a last dying gasp, I suppose, to try and make steam engines viable commercially. And Black Prince, of course, my engine, was only eight years old when I bought her, and the 17th last locomotive to be built and would have been scrapped years before our time. The job of fireman was one of the least understood and most responsible on the railways. Towards the end of steam, lads of 16 or 17 were thrown into a man-sized roll, and not all of them stayed the course. The engine driver was unlikely to leave the job, but the turnover in firemen was colossal. A lot of documentaries always written or filmed about the driving side of the steam locomotive. It's the thing that people see the most, with the question we're always after, you the driver. But some people want to know about the firing side, and for my mind, the fireman's job is actually the more difficult. He's got a very difficult balancing act to perform. He needs to keep sufficient boiler pressure for the locomotive to work. He needs to keep sufficient water in the boiler. Lighting and comfy seats was a thoroughly modern layout, and Riddles would have been impressed by its steam raising capacity. But his job was not an easy one. He came in as nationalisation started, didn't he, 1947, 48, um, and was charged with making a standard class of locomotives which would suit each region. And from that point of view, I think he's been very successful, but it must have been a little bit of a poison chalice because everybody wanted to go in their direction at that time, um, and he had to pull the whole lot together and make very viable and uh, less labour-intensive locomotives which would run the railway, as it turns out, into the mid-60s. One way of making a locomotive less labour intensive is to limit it to two outside cylinders so that the motion is accessible. And why not make sure someone else has already designed out the bugs? Riddles needed to look no further than the best of Midland locomotive design, like this tank engine. Ivert's Class II locomotive was to become one of the blueprints of standard design. The roomy cab was typical of a practical design which had already been tested on regions other than the Midland. Southern railwaymen still remember them fondly. When they came out, they replaced, because the Bricklayer's Arms used to have a lot of carriage sidings all over the place. Wartime austerity measures meant there was little new in the way of mainline motive power at the time of nationalisation. Among the notable exceptions were Bullitt's two types of Pacific passenger locomotive. This is the rebuilt West Country version, minus its spam can casing and controversial chain-driven valve gear and enclosed oil bath. What it did have was a brilliant boiler and a firebox fabricated in steel. The 
see my, like anything with a boiler, the superb boiler. That's one of the pluses of the locomotive. It's a, it's a modern design of boiler if you can have a modern steam engine. And it's got a steel firebox, which is steel is obviously weldable. Copper is much more difficult to, to do. Uh, just a, a great design of boiler. The nationalised railways were planning to standardise locomotive design under Riddles, who'd been Sanya's right-hand man on the LMS. There was a lot they could learn from engines like Tall Valley, but lesson number one was not to get involved in too many design experiments which had plagued these otherwise excellent southern engines. The West Country's footplates, complete with electric... Some, um, Blackheath, Maysdale, Grove Park, they were where they kept empty coaching stock. And some of the jobs we had at Bricklayer's Arms was to get hold of one of these C-class, H-star stamp, get hold of these coach, and you'd run around all day with this coaching in the different places while it was cleaned and washed, pick it up in the city in the morning and take it back in the evening. All day you was on these trains and these little H-star stinks. Along come the Ivet tank and they made job, the job a lot easier because there was plenty of room, nice room we can. The only thing was that we found that if you dropped back to 160 pounds of steam, the brakes started going on. It was something we, we learned the hard way, you know, we was going up over the arches into London and we were coming to a stand with a vacuum brake going on. There was a reason for it, but we found out what it was after a while. As well as the 262 layout, Riddles and his designers adopted the LMS 264 layout for the Class 4 tank that was to become one of the most successful of all the standard designs. And they hadn't forgotten the Black Five either. A higher running plate, bigger driving wheels, and slightly more power were included in the standard Class 5 machine that was eventually to find its way onto some of the heaviest trains rostered alongside much bigger engines. Some of these much admired middleweights were even given names. This one is Camelot. This is the Class 4 tender engine introduced in 1940.